Welcome back, um, everyone. I'm very happy to have Ivone Gebara with us today. Uh, Ivone has a PhD in philosophy and in science of religion, and uh, she is a writer, a lecturer, and um, an author of many books and articles. And Ivone has lived in Recife uh, for over 30 years, where she held a position as professor at the Institute of Technology. And she advises several groups and gives courses in national and foreign universities. And we're very, very happy to have Ivona with us today. Um, I know that many people came especially to see you. Um, you will speak about uh, patriarchal Christianity and give a brief outline for an eco-feminist ethics for human coexistence. So thank you for coming and I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. This light is very strong in my face. So. Good afternoon, everyone. Is the sound okay? So, the title of this lecture is Beyond Patriarchal Christianity, a brief outline for an eco-feminist ethics. So I would like to start with a brief introduction that I haven't thought about before, but I think it's important to remind you that in an event like this, marked by attention and art, I'd like to remember the intimacy between relationship and art. And this intimacy is so strong in art history as it is in the religion, the history of religion, because art was the great mentor, I could say, catheticized of the people before the written text. And that is not only true for Christianity, where I'm going to be going back on and on on this conversation, but it's also true for Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islamism, as the art was a source of meaning production, production of meaning, I would say. And I think that my presence here as a philosopher and theologist, I'm not a specialist in either art, in neither in known art, classical art, but uh, I think that I'm a specialist of trying to get close to the construction and the mutation of this, the meaning of life throughout religion. So this afternoon, I would like to talk specifically about the contribution of Christianity for a historical and cultural construction of the Americas. Why I'm going to talk about that? Because I think that I want to get to ecofeminism and to get there, I need to start by that. I need to draw attention for ourselves to the history in the past 500 years in the Americas, uh, history where Christianity had an absolutely crucial role, and it's, it still does. When I talk about Christianity, the people think that we know what Christianity is, we have the impression that, OK, it's Christian. But what does that mean? And we don't realize, um, trying to go back to the last scene, the last event that we had here, the beautiful snapshot of the wall changing and mutation of the wall. So I would like to follow this perspective where Christianity is a phenomena in the process of mutation. And to say that Christianity is in the process of mutation, it creates 
lots of problems. Christianity imposes itself as a religious power, the arm of a secular power presenting itself as the representation of something that is immutable, uh, the perfect God, the, cr the creator, the only son, Jesus. And also, it's marked by a dogmatic conception of immutability. And right now, you, as artists, you're going to be able to understand that mutation of the Christianity and the Christian meaning is as if Christianity could be differentiated at the same time from one single way. There's not one single form of Christianity, and there's not one single context. There are different forms and different contexts. And the image that comes to mind is Christianity as a sort of paint in the life of many peoples, many groups, peoples, uh, paint with different textures, different drawings, different forms, and historical actions that are differentiated. And also with artists that are different. And when I talk about the artists, I'm talking about people that in their multiplicity, in their complexity, or in their simplicity, lived and presented Christianity in different forms. So I'm talking about Christianity as a phenomena that is plural. And I'm not saying that it's only a religious, religious phenomena. It's more than anything religious, but it's also a cultural plural phenomenon. And this plurality touches the whole set that we call beliefs that are crucial to the Christianity. I'm going to talk about them later. And in reality, they are not exactly crucial fundamentals of Christianity to formulate the, of dogmatic formulations, but we need to be aware that each person interprets their contact and tune in them. So each rock that falls has a different adjustment or tuning in this wall that is modifying, just like the wall changes, the rocks are also changing. So us who call ourselves Christians are changing ourselves, uh, are embracing all the movements throughout history and cultures. So today, more than ever, religious paintings that are called Christians, they are very diverse. And sometimes they are very contra contradictory, like if they had nothing in common besides some words and some references to the Bible that looks like should be the common book. It looks like the common book, but it just looks like because there are multiple interpretations that are given to it. And sometimes it makes me doubt that people are reading the same book because the meanings are so diversified that we can doubt it. So today, I would like to remind you that we are in in times of praising individuality. So each individuality thinks it needs to obey their own design. And they don't realize that in reality, we are in a common world that is changing. And from that, I think that in the 24, 20th century, the 21st century showed different 
paintings of or pictures of the Christianity that uh, that added to the multicultural museum called Christianity. Several works of art that are different, and none of these works that I trying to propose to you is one that I call the Christianity eco-feminist. That means it's a Christianity marked by an ecological and feminist point of view. I was talking before that Christian churches in Brazil, and I can say that in Latin America in general, they don't like the eco-feminist Christianity. Even eco, they can accept, but feminist is a little bit complicated. So why? And how does this paint is born? This eco-feminist painting is born around the end of the 1970s when a group of women started to realize the amount of ecological disasters starting with Chernobyl and these disasters or catastrophes, they happen on and on. And in Brazil, it's happening all the time, uh, never ending. We cannot only talk about Mariana, but you have to remind to remember Paula Afonso Catacara too, the Amazon forest, and several other disasters that are not because of the, the living of the human being and the nature together, but the capitalist way of living and nature. So, it is born in, that's what I call, eco-feminist Christianity. And here in Latin America, especially a group of Chilean women that unfortunately had to end their work because they didn't have means, financial means, Chilean women. Who, but in reality, they were just a conglomerate of Chilean women, Americans, and German that founded a magazine that is called, or that it used to be called, Conspiring, Conspirando. And I was part of this magazine. Not only the magazine, no, but we also had courses that we gave in several parts of Latin America, but especially in Chile. In very briefly, what does that mean, this echo, or this Christian theology eco-feminist? The first thing is that we believe that the interdependency that exists, well, that we, this interdependence is coming back since the beginning of this afternoon in several ways. The interdependency is a fundamental for a new ontology and a new ethics. What does that mean? It means that it's not only hierarchy of beings, first God, then the human being, the white humans, and then heterosexual human beings, and then the homosexual, and then the woman, the women, and so on and so forth. It, that's not the vision, the hierarchical vision that starts with the image of God the Father, but it's a Christianity, and you're going to say, but where is Christianity there? I'm going to let you know. It's a Christianity that has as a in its base, the ontological and philosophical base. And what I'm trying to say is that 
all beings like the ants, the cockroach, the birds, the trees, the air, waters, going all the way through the worms that are in the fields and in the earth, everything is marked by this interdependency. So in consequence, if I say that everything is marked by this, this interdependency, I'm, I'm saying that I need to move out from the hier hier hierarchical Christianity that was established, especially from the fourth century and on. If I were attempted, if I paid attention to the life, if I pay, if we were present in ourselves and in our world, we don't need any proof of this interdependency. We can only state that there is this origin of interdependency and it's present in the Milky Way, in every energy in Earth, in every fetal process, and presence, present also in human processes. Of course, you're going to say, OK, but everybody talks about interdependencies. OK, that's the problem. We talk about interdependencies from a theoretical point of view. But we don't leave it in dependency from a practical point of view. That means we don't leave interdependencies in relationships. We don't leave interdependencies in economy. We don't leave interdependencies in politics. We don't leave interdependencies in religious beliefs. Believing in interdependency really means to uh, or requires an attention on ourselves and organizing our actions in a different way from what we are living right now. Interdependencies means that in order to be to exist, I, I I need the support of other lives. That to exist, I depend on these other lives, and they depend on me. So. With that, my life, beside, before being mine, before being my individuality, it is shown as a collectiveness. The existence is only possible once we have collectiveness, it, once it's supported by the collectiveness. And of course, based on interdependencies. So this seems like it's the fundamental for a different way of looking at the cosmos, the planet Earth, or every ecosystem, but also looking at or looking at the the human beings and interdependency shows me that hierarchies were built and the interdependency is a natural element in every life. So interdependency will reveal who are the human beings. Who it's going to reveal this new ontology that consequently will need a new ethics. And that's what I'm referring mainly as a new social ethics. Um, getting to a point where I'm saying in religions, there is a problem that also exists in other sciences, because sometimes we talk about education, psychology, ethical values. But in reality, we turn these words that are, and we empty them. So we empty the word interdependence when we vulgarize it and reduce it to one simple uh, term that is used, and it's uh, like a fashion world. 
uh, word. I'm going back to religion. And there are several uh, religion words that involve like, like God, um, love to loving each other, the divine, all these expressions and words, they they start they, they, they don't have a, a real correspondent anymore. They became empty words. So I can communicate you with empty words. I can communicate with just formalities. I can turn on the TV and watch the news that are actually not what the reporter is leaving, but they are. They must say what they have to say. They have to empty the word from the content it has for for them, and they have to oblige in a very alienated way to the content that is required, so he can keep his or, or they can keep their jobs. So. I think that we women were maybe the f were the first to realize how alienated we live we have lived from our reality. How much the how much religious wor words weren't referring to us, but those were words that people were teaching us from themselves, and we were just repeating as if they were ours. We used to talk about a uh, powerful, all-powerful God, but at the same time, this divinity was distant from our body. We didn't know who this God was. We we listen to things that God told them to dominate the earth. How can you dominate earth? We cannot dominate earth like this. In a way that we started being more attentive to ourselves and to the content of the words that we were using and realize that not only provoking religion, that they, they were not meant to religion and society, but they were separating us. They were also throwing in our bags the capitalist destruction of nature. And how were they putting it on our backs? You can just say all the testimonies from women who were victims of all those disasters in Mariana, for instance, or so many places where toxic materials were thrown in, a, in such a unrespectful way for people's lives. So these women were the first victims, not in a sense that they received more toxic than other people, but they were more victims of the meaning of their responsibi social responsibility, of having to, to really provide food for themselves and their families, don't have a, a land to plant, don't have my, uh, food to give to their kids, no more water. I'm talking about women. Maybe I should talk about women like uh, uh, builders of alternatives, victims, but also they build alternatives. And from this moment, we started to realize the complicity of destruction with the complicity also from the capitalism, as of course, but the complicity of religions. Religions, they continued in a very particular way, especially Christianity, kept their speech of a powerful God. And at the same time, they 
the re religions weren't denouncing the burdens that we women were carrying on our day-to-day -day lives. Maybe they could denounce the destruction and feel guilty about it, but they didn't realize how serious the vital problems that we were carrying. So, working in a theological perspective, Christian perspective, is reworking all Christian concepts Dear God, our Father, Jesus as the Son, in a different perspective, in the perspective of interdependency and consequently in the perspective that will change this kind of metaphysical hat that guarantee throughout our days. I don't want to be radical, but in the middle of all this. There's all, there are also good things, gestures of love, but mainly the type of Christianity, hierarchical, patriarchal, dogmatic Christianity, there still dominates, especially women's bodies. This Christianity doesn't contribute to a evolutionist vision of life, more respectful view of life. And in the same line, I go back now in a very brief way. I don't know if I'm running out of time. still have 10 minutes. I'm going back in theology that us women, ecologists and feminists do the inheritance from the prophetic Judaism and the movement uh, and the G Jesus movement, not from Jesus, but Jesus movement, in a sense that believing that the readings that they present that were presented to us from about Jesus is our readings that are not sustainable in the, this interdependency line. We call it the Jesus movement. This expression was coined by a German theologist, Elizabeth Fiorenza. She came to Latin America several times and helped us to progress in this line of talking about talking about Jesus movement that means is an ethics an inclusive ethics that follows a prophetic tradition of denouncing social injustice and deny, denouncing um, injustice against the earth the planet and the access of a society that is not able to look with care the other the others the, the marginalized is not able to receive the pain of these women and see them in these different ways so in this line of thought is it that we try to regain the inheritance and tradition of from both Christian and Judaist traditions of the women trying to seek for a land which is actually our body, a body which is our land, of seeking to be the, see, the meat of this land and the land for this meat and trying to abandon a patriarchal scheme of exploration. So in this line of thought, we've been f reading the biblical tradition in the perspective of recovering the ethical strength that comes from our path that 
ruptures within the present and will continue into the future, but not excluding the people, not excluding our planet. And so in, at this moment, my last point is that many of us women, although we are connected by our history to the Christian churches, both the Protestant as well as the Catholic Church, and the new Pentecostal churches as well, many of us women are not placed within these hierarchical communities as being vital communities. We begin to work in within other environments, environments which are not called religious environments. So many of us women create popular educational groups, literature groups, poetry groups, dance groups, theater groups. I myself work in a theater, in a popular theater group. In other words, we study and reflect and we can advance because the structures of the churches do not allow us to leave this I conception that God is all powerful and in some way distinct from his creation, although he is present, he is distinct, and his creature has to obey his order, the creator's orders. And then we ask ourselves, where, who has the power to say what are the orders of the creators and then us women understand that the orders of the creator are given by men men powerful men who judge themselves the best the best directors of human life and with this excluded excluded the animals excluded the women excluded the plants from their theoretical reflections. So we are at this moment distancing ourselves from a view that's tremendously hierarchical that comes from Christianism into opening the construction of small communities in places outside of churches, outside of the tradition of celebrations and mass. Once again, it is not a criticism that I am making. It's just to show that something is happening and it's different in the search for justice and the respect for women, seeking the respect for ecosystems, not as a word, but as an action. Our action has to become word. Our action has to become flesh. in this path through our history. I remember when I was preparing this speech, I saw a citation from uh, a wise Indian who went to visit a convent of nuns in France and the mother superior to welcome him well, this wise man from India. Isn't it, mister, that we have to pray nonstop? And the wise man looked at her attentively and said, of course, we have to pray nonstop. But what does it mean to pray nonstop? And he answered, to pray is to be attentive and present 
to what is. To pray is to give permission for the world to come within me and I go within the world, that I be the body of the world and the world be my body, that I be the mutation of the world and the world be mutation within. So I enhanced a little bit this wise man's speech, but I am introducing here the notion, again, of interdependency, in individuality and collectiveness interpenetrating, individuality, forests, oceans and oceans interpenetrating, fertilizing and transforming them into individual and collective life at the same time. I believe from what I was able to read in your agenda at the biennial, that something is changing. I think a new concept of beauty is slowly being built and slowly arising. I don't have many words to say, but I see the importance of what it is that you are working on with regards to attention. And for me to be attentive, I have to silence. Also, with regards to the things that I've learned in the past, my past convictions, my familiar ideals from the, my Christian past, I have to silence to welcome the arrival of this new beauty, to be able to embrace and enjoy this new beauty that is beginning to blossom among us. Thank you very much.